This video is brought to you by Holocasa. Our tool transforms independent local real estate agents to global real estate agents. Create your own profile for free and get contacted by international investors. Sign up with the link in the description. Hello and welcome everyone to our 101st session of Holocast. My name is Mike and today I'm talking to Kyle Stevenson from Richmond, Virginia. Kyle has been active in uh, res uh, residential real estate as an investor for the last 30 plus years and enjoys stabilizing distressed and mismanaged properties. Currently managing approximately 4,000 units. Kyle, I'm super pumped to have you on the show. You're the first person from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, thank you, Michael, so much for having me. Um, Again, my name is Kyle Stevenson. I do live in Richmond, Virginia, originally from uh, a state right outside, actually, of New York. I relocated to Richmond. I'm originally from New Jersey. And anybody from New Jersey, Michael, they're real proud of being from New Jersey. But but if you're not from New Jersey, you think kind of New Jersey is kind of one of the more disgusting states in the United States. So uh, relocating to Richmond, real excited to be here. Virginia is an incredible state to do business and and really follow my true love, which is real estate investing. I've been down here now for for uh, for a little bit over 25 years. Amazing. Give us an overview of Richmond, Cali uh, Richmond Virginia. I always say Richmond, California. <laughs> yeah. uh, for the ones, especially like who have never been maybe to Virginia, to the US, uh, how can I imagine myself, this, this city? Sure. So Richmond, Virginia is a city which is which is approximately 1.3 million individuals and to compare that to uh, some of the other cities in the united states um the washington dc metropolitan area has about 6 million people and that's about 100 miles north of richmond virginia and then you have something like the boroughs of manhattan which I think are, you know, 17, between 17, maybe and 20 million people. So it's substantially smaller than 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 the larger uh, uh, cities in the in the country. But it's, you know, there are about 200 people within the city proper. And then it sprawls out into more rural uh, settings where um, which is more of a suburbia American suburbia type of uh, of setting, but a great place. Uh, the The cost of living is substantially less than a Washington D.C. or or a New York. Um, therefore, there are heavy growth trends into this area. Um, I am bullish and, and and excited about the trends that I see from a population growth standpoint. Um, it is not the best kept secret anymore. So we have a lot of people that are coming here. There are uh, a few universities, University of Richmond, Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, you're an hour away from University of Virginia. So it's a fairly educated um, um, area of the uh, of the Commonwealth as well. Perfect. Th thank you so much. You just mentioned that Virginia is a good state to make business. Uh, are there particular reasons for that? Tax-wise, maybe legal, uh, legally, uh, some um, advantages, some uh, ease of doing business over other cities or states? Sorry. So, specifically speaking from a landlord standpoint, um, we believe that it is a much more landlord-friendly state than from the experiences that we have had, let's say in Maryland or Washington, DC. Um, we had at one point looked at doing business in both of those areas and there are substantially more um, uh, tenant rights, which which just makes it more difficult if you're a landlord. I don't I don't say it's good or bad. We're just asking about ease of doing business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I would say that the taxation rates are a little bit different, uh, a little bit more um, appealing in Virginia. And um, uh, the the cost of entry. Um, so when I looked at investing in some cities that are, you know, a little bit further north, um, you know, it may require, let's say, $100,000 to begin my investment uh, uh, career, where it could be 50% of that here in, in Richmond, Virginia to get the ball rolling. So I would say that the, the barriers to entry 
are, uh, are could be exponentially less as well. Makes total sense. Thank you so much for the um, overview. Now coming a little bit more towards Richmond uh, from a real estate perspective, can you divide the city a little bit into um, neighborhoods which are upcoming, which are already like a little bit um, satisfied regarding valuation and also maybe business districts regard, uh, versus residential so that the audience gets an overview? Sure. So while it doesn't look again, I use New York City because it, you know most people are familiar with Manhattan or Brooklyn. So I always so the uh, the the downtown area called the Fan, or there is a neighborhood called the Fan or Scott's Edition. If you hear those, or the Museum District, those districts, I would say, are the most expensive areas to reside in the city. So I would define that as Manhattan. And there may be 100,000 people that live in that area. There are areas that are up and coming. Uh, there's an area called Manchester. Again, we can call it a neighborhood. I define that as Brooklyn. And there happens to be a little river, the James River that goes through, I guess it's a little bit, it's a river that goes through. And so I would kind of define that as Brooklyn. And then as we sprawl out away from these areas, it, it, it turns into um, uh, suburbs that are more densely populated and then and then suburbs that start to sprawl out. Uh, the, the western part of the city has a higher income um, level. The, 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 the real estate is worth a little bit more and the individuals that live there have higher incomes. I guess that only makes sense. And then the areas to the east and to the south are um, are, are a, a little bit more uh, cost effective uh, to to live as you you get maybe five to ten miles out. Um, okay. Yep, makes total sense. Um, of, of those neighborhoods, would you say like there's something right now uh, which is in high demand, something which uh, you think there's like some um, upside potential, and you would maybe also go and say, um, yeah, that's definitely something you would maybe consider buying um, regarding, let's say, cost or investments to uh, to rent ratio, um, demand versus availability. Is there any neighborhoods or a couple of them which you would suggest? Yeah. Michael, so I am a huge advocate and I know that there is a national push um, here in the United States for affordable housing. And what I believe in, and my beliefs may be different than others, is that that families and individuals, I shouldn't use the term families, but individuals have the right to live in clean, safe, affordable housing. And so I am a big believer in finding maybe older properties, um, You know, I'm I, I'm a fan of Eastern Henrico because this is, you know, one of the areas or Eastern Richmond, okay, where um, some of the stock is just substantially older and worn down. Seeing if I can fix something like that up, but the, the properties are a little bit smaller as well. And seeing if I can rent that um, to long-term tenants that wish to have clean, you know, work hard. I always say um, work for a living, you know, and deserve to come home and enjoy, you know, their family and their home for years and years and years. So that is what I'm a huge advocate of. And I love that area. I also like that, you know, as I said, towards the uh, Southern side of, of Richmond, again, some older stock, It's something where you have to put a little bit of elbow grease behind, uh, you know, a little bit of work, a little bit of grit. But I think the return, both financially and for me, socially, um, is 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 very exciting and very fulfilling. Makes total sense. I really like the approach um, because in the end, um, it is what you say, making sure that also let's say it's not necessarily the bottom of the pyramid but the middle of the pyramid has accessible housing but also has safe housing and um, doesn't have to 
live like in a rundown um, yeah, neighborhood and maybe apartment. I totally get that. Um, this actually is also already a very good um, segue towards your business. Um, give us an overview of um, your service offerings and uh, your business uh, and your company in general. Yeah. So I love, I obviously it's my business and it's my company. So hopefully I do love it. Right. But, <laughs> but I, I love what we do. I love what we stand for. Um, so we try to, and now we, we manage all types of property. So we manage a class and I define it as sexy stuff, right? Stuff with a lot of bells and whistles and, and, um, uh, you know, and, and that could be apartments, that could be gorgeous estate homes. Um, do not get me wrong. Those are pretty cool to, to manage. But again, what provides a lot of nourishment and is very fulfilling for the majority of our firm is to work with owners or we may work with banks we may, or I'll say lenders, it could be insurance companies that have had to take properties back or, but non-performing things that have been in distress, trying to take that, all right, and position it in a matter, in a, in a manner that there's a healthy return for the investor, but that we're providing an incredible product for individuals, again, that work their butts off for a living and deserve to be able to come home for clean, safe, affordable housing. So we may take, and this is interesting, we may take a property and somebody is living in the property. They may not take care of the property. It may be that that, that individual, the, uh, the property just is in disrepair. And I admit one of the things emotionally that is sometimes difficult is you may have someone that let's say pays a disproportionate amount less than they should. So in US dollars, let's just say that someone is paying, I'm, I'm going to, I want this to be clear to people. Let's say someone is paying $150 a month for housing, but the plumbing doesn't work. The roof leaks. There are a lot of things that are going on on that property. But they don't complain because they pay $150 a month. Our goal, okay, is not to charge $15,000 a month, all right, but to charge enough that we can provide a roof that doesn't leak, a kitchen where the plumbing works, a place where you can truly shower, you know, and that, that you don't have to, that you really don't, you know, that these individuals at $150 a month may not be able to bathe. So you, you, you do have to sometimes displace people. I'm not going to make it sound as if there are not difficult decisions to make. And we could get into really some great social debates because the deal is there are people that just need shelter that's not what we're providing. We're 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 trying to provide, and I think you said it before, Michael. It's not the bottom of the barrel. It's the individual that has that job and you know wants to come home and 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 be happy where they live. Um, and so that's what we seek to do, and that's what we're good at, and and brings us probably some of our most rewarding experiences. I totally get it, and I think. Um this difference between providing for people on welfare versus the one who really worked their butt off, I'm sorry, my, my English, is uh, what you're focusing on because that's what you want to also nurture and you also want to um, support. Because talking to people who are just getting a check from doing nothing is a different mindset and you want to go and say, okay, it might be more problems to have someone who might be at the edge of losing their job and we have like then other problems than someone where we get the paycheck directly or the the rental the rent directly from the state but that's not our mindset we want to go and uh, and and support the ones who really make the effort to to go for a 
for a for a job is that uh, do i understand that correctly oh michael see you're, you're you know it's interesting because again i i, I don't want to make political statements or you know what but i i do i do want to make a, a comment especially around government checks so i support government checks but probably believe there there needs to be a limit and i don't care just pick one pick 10 years pick 15 years just don't say in perpetuity because what i believe is that unless you or you put some teeth around it and that those teeth you know have to be related to i think habits uh productive habits because if i get rewarded for not working understand I'm getting rewarded for not working. So why would I work if I'm getting rewarded for not working? So, so I, I know that that is a really touchy subject. Um, but, but that is, that is kind of how I feel. Now we, uh, will rent to people who, um, uh, well in, in Virginia, the one thing is, is that you have, to, there are some laws around where the income comes from, but our goal is exactly what you stated. The individual's that are working their butts off. Okay. That's exactly what it is, right? It's, it's a hundred and, you know, five degrees and you've worked your butt off for the day and you want to come home and you want the ability that the air conditioning turns on and you can take a nice shower and you can sit down and you can have supper with your family and relax. That, that is exactly what we like to do. That is our that we really like that. And and by the way, a lot of those individuals really like the fact that we like to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I can totally imagine. <laughs> and if, if you allow my uh, uh, if you allow me to give another comment on this one, uh, I know there's like uh, Europe Europe is much more socialist than uh, than the US for sure. So we are at the like I can give you like an anecdote on how where Germany is at the moment that employers are basically starting to have the challenge or face the challenge that people are quitting because the deal is better to be on welfare than for like um, low income job. So basically the low in income jobs are now competing with social welfare because in the end they just can go and still work a little bit like uh, without uh, declaring it on the tax uh, on the tax return. So, and then, you know, this entire setup is much better. Um, and then also on the other hand a lot of retired people having and this is a huge um, clientele in germany affordable housing for um for retired people because they have been working all their lives and in the end the pension the the money which they're getting from the government is not inflationary adjusted at all and they have to pay the rent and now what we see is in bigger cities like especially berlin a lot of a uh, lot of old people on the street basically either going for an additional job or going and collecting um you know those uh, those bottles in order to get the return from the supermarket oh. um which is obviously for someone like post war generation is uh questionable and maybe um below what they should receive that's a little bit like an anecdote there from uh, from my western or european uh, german german experience so it's interesting because again from the states and we are not we, we well it's it's really interesting to be on this podcast i'm i'm absolutely loving this because we don't in the united states the media does not do a good job sharing what some of the experiences are in other countries and i think that if we could get just a more open here are the good things that go on and here are the things that are not so good or here is the opinion of another country and um that it would allow that, that all countries could function a little bit better so there may be some things in the states that you're like, hey, the states actually they do this okay. Um, you know, what um one of the things that's going on in the states right now is we have um, you know, probably we have a lot of immigrants coming from the southern border. 
And it is my understanding that we are paying for the, the, the individuals that are coming across that we may give them checks and they're, they're, they're staying here. And one of the things, but we have a, we have a shortage of labor. And so the, the individuals that come here, they come here to work. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't necessarily come here to get a check and not work. And so one of, and, and I know I'm simplifying all of this on a, on a, you know, less than hour podcast, but one of the things, again, I'm like, well, you know, if we could facilitate um, the work visas, you know, I think a lot of Americans think, oh, well, people are coming here. They want to live in the States. No, they don't necessarily want to live in the States. They'd like to work in the States. They don't leave because they're here illegally. They'd love to be able to come in, work for six months and go home. They don't like people like their own countries. Like it's not. <laughs> so, um, so if we could find a way to expedite the work visas, I bet you we could have better outcomes. Now, again, I'm not an expert at this. This is just me thinking of behaviors and working with some individuals that have work visas that want to go back home and be with their families. They don't want to be here. Uh, they don't want to be here forever. And, and it's like, well, but if you do, but if the work visa takes you years to get and you're that desperate to get out of the situation that you're in, I could see where you're maybe risking your life. Absolutely. Um, so anyway, for, for what it's worth, I know we're not going to solve all of the world problems, but I'm so happy that you're sharing some of this with me, Michael, because now you got me all excited about, hey, this is, again, you know, this is what's going on in Germany. Like, why do we not get that you just can't continually reward people totally. for not working? Yeah, absolutely. It is exactly this, you know, like, why don't we share and learn from each other in a more collaborative way? And um, why don't we do cross-pollination across um, cultures uh, and learnings? And always, obviously, having in mind the societal and cultural context. Um, I, I want to gear back or towards your starting of your business. You have been in this, uh, in running this company for a long time. Tell me, first of all, your motivation, how everything started. And um, also, I know starting a business is full of challenges. So uh, why don't you give us some some anecdotes on um, on the first years when you started off this? Yeah, so it's brutal, right? So, um, so admittedly, and this is one thing I always share with anybody that wants to start a business or run a business is you really should have a passion for the business. I've read books about, oh, this is what you should do. And you do it just to make money. And that's not me. Um, I think that when the going gets tough, if you don't love with you know what you're doing, you're probably going to end up quitting. And so um, I had... I, even since university, was in love with the concept that real estate, because it is a leverageable business in the, in the States, and it's a, one, of the, one of the higher leverageable biz businesses, was the only way that someone who wasn't a doctor or lawyer, so in the States, being a doctor or lawyer is, is, is you know, you kind of think of those people as making the, the big money. You know, that if you were just an average American, again, you know, my father happened to be an immigrant from Jamaica. My mother, you know, was uh, and, and he came to the States, um, you know, with a minimal amount of money and you know worked for, for the government for a number of years. And my mother was a school teacher. And so um, very average uh, class um, uh, was the way that I you know, was raised. If, if you didn't make a ton of money, you could take the, the, the money that you have and you could buy a home and then you could over time leverage it. And I would read books and I would read books like uh, No Money Down by Robert Allen. And as time progressed, and it's been a number of years, and I'm sure a lot of people on the call, if not you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, right? So if you really kind of listen to the foundations Real estate, as long as you do it properly, can provide wealth for the average American. And so when I 
left university, I was selling literally toilet paper. I worked for a company selling toilet paper to grocery stores. And then I ended up selling um, uh, uh, medical devices, which, which is a better job than selling toilet paper. There's nothing wrong with selling toilet paper. Everybody needs it. But medical devices was a better job. But I wouldn't spend a lot of my income. So everybody who knows me, I'm still very frugal. And I save. And so I was able to cobble together a little bit of money and buy my first investment. And then over time, that investment grew. Um, and I continued to uh, save money and was able to buy a couple more. And this was really, you know, maybe for the first 10 years. Um and then after about 10 years, you develop equity. And I uh, I was able to sell one of the properties and then trade that into something a little bit larger. So, you know, for the first 10 years, and I was in my 20s, and you know, for the first 10 years of my life, that's really what it, it looked like. And I would read and invest and work. And, yeah. and, and you were still having the day job, the medical device. And I job. had the day job. Mm -hmm. I had the day job. Now. Second 20 years of my life or my work life, I transitioned out of medical really hard, really hard decision. And um, it, it was very, very difficult. And so I left. I didn't have, you always think you have enough savings, you always think you have enough going on. But what I didn't realize, Michael, is that we were going to hit the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, right at the time that I left. And as I share with people, you couldn't, I tell you about leveraging, leveraging requires banks. Well, all of the banks were in a bad spot. And so I wasn't able to borrow any money. I wasn't able really to grow on top of that you had banks that were calling notes, you know? And so by that, I mean, like they wanted you to pay the note off, even if you were current. That's something that a lot of people, they're like, well, what do you mean, Kyle? And I'm like, look, they didn't have any money. So the people that were current, they were trying to get them to pay off their loans or they would, if you're, you know, if, so if your loan was up because it, there were maturities, you know, you, you in, in the United States, there's for commercial loans, there may be only five years or something like that. So, I mean, there were times where, um, and then you'd have to negotiate back and say, well, I can't pay it all back today, but can I pay you a little bit more on the payment? But that meant that you had less cash. So there were times I remember, we joke about it, but I remember like I had, I had gas in the car, but like, let's say that I wanted to drive to an appointment and I was used to using a toll road. I didn't have the money for the tolls. So you have to take the long way, the scenic route. <laughs> so, um, and, th and that's the way it was. But what we did is we started going to the banks because I'm a salesperson. And we said, hey, I know that a lot of people aren't paying their mortgages. Can we help manage some of those properties? And long and behold, that was the way that we really started in this business was to manage the properties to help the bank get their mortgage payment current. And that's how the, the, the business bloomed, but it was incredibly difficult. Um, a lot of sleepless nights, everything that, you know, people tell you about. And, um, and, and, and now we have, you know, we've served over a thousand clients and have thousands of units and we're kind of the go-to for lenders that are in tough situations. And I mean, we've seen, I don't want to say we've seen it all because there are always things that we're learning, but that's that's really what we've done and where we're at. Allow me to uh, clarify this. So basically, the bank was not only asking for the normal monthly installments; they were asking for the all the money which was still due because oh. of the of the terms and conditions which no one normally reads uh, that they have the right to ask for all the payment at once. So what happens is, let's say that you go borrow. 
I'm just going to give you an example. Let's say you borrow a million dollars, all right? That's a lot of U.S. dollars, okay? And you borrow that, the bank will say, well, we'll lend you that million dollars, but you have to pay it back in five years. So you make your payments. Now, usually what would happen is after five years, the bank says, okay, we'll re-up the loan. We'll renew the loan. Or I can go to another bank as long as I'm a good guy, okay? And I can say, hey, I have a, I have a loan now for $900,000 because I paid it down. Will you, well, that all, that, that, that business shut down. So at the end, they were like, hey, thanks for doing business with us. Can we have our million dollars back? And you're like, well, that's going to be a problem because I don't have a million dollars. So they would say, well, that's a shame. We'll foreclose on the property, but that's not really what they want to do. So um, so the deal would be, all right, I know I pay you $5,000 a month. Can we renew it? But I'll pay you six or seven thousand. They kind of had, but but if you were making a little bit of money and you were using that money to live, that money was all gone. Mm -hmm. It was going to the bank. Mm -hmm. So it was it was it was a really bad place to be. I understand. Really so, bad place. So you didn't have the problem of like uh, the, of like worse conditions regarding interest rates. It was much more that they just wanted to have more cash and they wanted to have even the. Um, sorry, the um, financing. The how do you call it again? The um, the amount which you have, which you're supposed to to pay uh, to pay back. It's principal. The, the principal payment, payment principal, basically. Yes. In, in, uh, they they so just Michael, have a, Yeah, sorry. Yeah, thanks. And, and the reason the reason is because I they would think well I can give them the million dollars back. I have other people who aren't paying me at all, so I have to get cash back to run my business, the banking business. So I'm going to talk to nobody. I mean, I can't ask for the people that are not paying their mortgages to pay it off because they're not even paying their mortgage. So they needed that cash back into the bank so that the bank could stay solvent. Got it. And how did you exactly, you said, you said then it was actually, I think like your action, like, towards the offense and not defense, uh, maybe someone would say, you know what, uh, let me call my medical device uh, employer again and see how he has a, if he has a job. And you went offense and you said, hey, actually, I see a problem there. We uh, we can help you banks getting your, uh, getting your money back by managing the tenants and managing the distressed company, uh, the, the distressed properties. Uh, right. properties. Yeah. Uh, what, did you, what did you exactly do there? So... Everybody has, um, so I'll, I'll tell you. So I, I had some employees at the time and there was, there was one individual specifically. I remember, you know, her just saying, look, I mean, you can do this. And she's still with me. She's an incredible woman. And, um, she, uh, she's like, you can do this. So, you know, I made a list because I didn't want, You know, the, the other part with a company is you have people dependent upon you. You're in a recession. People are losing their jobs all over the place. And so um, she just inspired me to uh, to really just suck it up. One of the comments she'll make sometimes is she'll be like, just, you know, you know, you're making all these comments and you're complaining. What are you going to do about it? And so... Um, You know, I was a salesperson, and so I was able to kind of just make a list of banks I could call and things I could do to to try to squeeze out of the situation. Because we knew if we could get out of it, that there was incredible upside. We just knew that it would, we were going to struggle a little bit. And and you then just said, okay, I'm going to manage the tenants. I'm going to uh, see if I can get the money. Or did you then buy the or take those those distressed companies yourself and said, okay, we're going to We're going to somehow manage that one. Oh, Michael, great question. So in most cases, it was really about making the bank current again on their mortgages. So helping them out. In some cases where the bank had foreclosed and the bank needed someone to purchase the property, uh, we, we, we did do that. We didn't do it a ton, but we did do it. And, and those were good acquisitions for us. Um, Uh, 
So, so yeah, in some cases we did that, but mostly, you know, because again, we, we needed, um, cash, you know, we, we, you know, we wanted to make sure that operating company had cash. So even when you're buying something, you're laying cash out for the most part, we didn't want to do that, um, to great degrees. Cause we didn't know when we were going to come out of the hole. We just, we, we just knew <laughs> that we didn't want the hole to get any deeper. Yeah, <laughs> makes makes so sense. And then from there, you grew. You said, "Okay, this actually works, and we can go into." And you obviously learned more and more skills. You got more experience, and then you went down the rabbit hole and went into like this sort of segment of distress company uh, property. We, sorry, we, we did because my fear had always been. So I had a I had a lack of self confidence, and um, but when we felt that we dealt with so much dirt so much grime, so many problems, we felt then, or I felt confident enough to go to anybody and say, look, you have a problem, we can fix it. I'm not afraid of it. I think one of the things that we do now really well is that we we identify the problem. So if, if somebody came to us and said, look, we have a problem, we look at it and we're like, well, you may define this as a problem, but we may not have a solution for you, but we really want to make sure that what you believe is your problem is a problem that we can fix. So we're really good at that. Um, we're really good at that. And do you have like a certain process there to say, okay, we have basically created like a certain blueprint, which is transferable throughout all my employees, because you have a lot of employees, you have a huge team and you have like a lot of uh, people working for you. I assume like the systems and processes you have put in place are basically based on your intrinsic uh, um, yeah, knowledge, which you have gained yourself. Um, do you have like... Did you create something like that, like a blueprint? We do, Michael. Great. So I would say that it's a lot of it depends on degree of difficulty. And so um, there are a lot of things that a lot of our team can handle and fix without me touching. And I, I compare it. This is probably an uncomfortable topic, but I bring it up because I was in medical. I compare it to... Um, you know, having a cold and that you can go to a general practitioner, all right, for a cold or for us, you know, a, a simple problem. Okay. We still have individuals, okay, that may come with stage four, all right, metastatic cancers with tumors all over their bodies, right? And then that is where I get involved and see if we have a solution to treat that cancer. And I, I share, I use that term because that term usually makes someone wince, but that's what we, we try to do. And so there, again, you know, we can handle easy things, but we don't mind taking a look at, um, you know, cancer that is spread to different organs. I understand, perfect. I assume now going through towards your entire company and uh, all your processes, I assume that you're not only going for inbound leads and you're going for outbound leads, obviously, meaning that you're very good at identifying potential and identifying certain yeah, business opportunities. Um, prior to our call, we talked a little bit about um, analytics, big data versus um, knowing the the barber shop and uh, the I don't know like maybe stories and uh, smelling so smelling the neighborhoods. I would like to know from your side um, regarding the best practices which you apply in order to get a proper market overview in Richmond and maybe identify very good opportunities and also just be on top of the market and stay on top. So. Instead of even talking about uh, Richmond, can we talk about what my suggestions would be for anybody in any market and how I would start off? Absolutely. Is that fair? Okay. So I believe that 
number one, the beauty, one of the beauties, we talked about real estate creating wealth better than any other investment vehicle. So we talked about that. The other beauty is it's so local that the individuals that are listening, they know their neighborhoods better than I know their neighborhoods. Okay. That is an advantage. And so what I share with, or they may, or the surrounding neighborhoods. And so my suggestion is number one, to start off with a single family home because they're just not as, it's not as dynamic. You know, there's one roof that covers one unit. There's one AC that or HVAC system, a heating cooling system that covers. There's there's just one of each thing. And when you're starting, you need to understand just that that stuff. You just don't want it to get too messy. And usually, residents, if you, if picked properly, also will stay longer in a single family home than another type of residence. Okay, so that's step one. Step two understand what it would take okay to rent that property what a fair rent would be and by that i mean you want to walk up and down the neighborhood you may want to ask people these are things some people are uncomfortable doing i have no problems going next door and knocking on the door hey do you rent this home um if so you know what do you you know what do you rent it for you know, I'm trying to understand the market. Be clear. There's no reason to hide what you're doing, you know? And so that you, you know, I don't look at Zillow. I don't look, that gives me an idea, but it doesn't tell me the truth. The truth is by knocking on the doors, asking people what they rent things for. Okay. And the reason you want to know this is you want to know truly how much money you're going to have coming in. And then you're going to know what the mortgage is or the payments for the property, all right? The other piece, especially with a single family home, you can either learn how to do some of the stuff on your own, or you can work with a handyman or something of that nature, but you can probably at least price out the materials and understand the labor. It's just, it's a lot simpler. And so what I would do is try to make sure you know what to do to clean it up completely, understand truly what that rent is. Um, I mean, there's some other the other little idiosyncrasies for me. I don't want a huge home. I want a smaller home because I don't want to uh, have to worry about, there's not a linear relationship between rent and, um, and space. A two bedroom, small home rents for almost the same as a two bedroom, large home. So, that's one of the things I would recommend. And, and then the other piece is to do it and, you know, go ahead and make the acquisition. If you can make the numbers work, I know that I'm simplifying it on a podcast, but, and then for you to personally manage that home for a year. So you understand seasonally what it feels like. Are there additional things? What are the things you like about it? What do you things that aren't? So that if you then want someone to help you manage it, you'll have a new level of appreciation for what they do or don't do. And so um, these would be the suggestions to kind of get the ball rolling and, and try to develop um, wealth, you know, as quickly as possible. Makes total sense. Do you see any um, challenges regarding the new mortgage rates, which are increasing and increasing, like pressure towards the tenants? So I think that inflation, right, is is what, so, oh gosh, you got me real excited now, Michael. So there are a couple of things around that. So again, that average worker is probably in the United States is making more money so they can pay more rent. So that is what's going on in the, in the, the rental market. Um, from a mortgage rate standpoint, my comment would be, if you can get a rate, if you can make the numbers work at a high rate, the beauty is rates will come down. They're not going to go down to what they were, let's say, two years ago. But over time, you know, let's say that they even go down by 25%. That's from, let's say, if it's 8%, it goes down to 6%. The beauty of that 
is you can refinance and your cost of money, you know, goes down by that. So if you were paying a thousand dollars a month, your cost of money now goes down to seven hundred and fifty dollars a month. That's a beautiful thing. Because in the end, you can still keep up rising rent. That's right. That's right. So if you can do it now, if you can make the numbers work now, the numbers should work later. I had someone on the podcast and I don't I remember the name. He said, just always see it from a case by case point. Like, okay, fair enough. If it works now, or if it works, if this property works and the Excel calculation works, then you shouldn't worry. That's fine. That's all you need to know. What's your opinion on that? Do you agree or do you have a different uh, opinion about that? So, um, I, I, I clearly, so, so I, th I think at least right now in this market, so my, my only comment on that would be individuals that it was working for a couple of years, if they have the wrong finance, <laughs> It's not going to work for them now. So because their rate, their rate went from 3%, let's say that they may need to re-up and the rate may be 6%. Well, now your cost of money is doubled. I would say that I like the position now much more than I would. I wouldn't have made that comment two years ago. I can make that comment now because I don't think, you know, if rates are 8%, do I think they're going to 16%? No. So I, I, I would say that um, that comment makes more sense now than it did two years ago. Makes sense. For yeah. what it's worth. Totally. Um, how about state-based um, incentives and uh, schemes which uh, landlords can use regarding mortgage rates, uh, regarding refinancing, um, I know there are certain states where you can get like a very favorable um, interest rate for your first time purchase. I think it's called, if it's called like a F F H I or something like this, like this mm -hmm. federal um, subsidy, which you get for um, I think like 3.5% down payment. And then you can go from there. Is there anything um, alike in the state of Virginia, which you can basically mm -hmm help and assist landlords throughout their lifetime and say, hey, let's start with that and then we can refine and we can upgrade and go basically like from a class A or class C property to a class B to a class A over the next 30 to 40 years. So from a financing standpoint, I'm unaware, like they have these things for new homeowners like FHA. And, that's the one, yeah. So that's it. That's what I thought. Okay. Mm -hmm. From an investment standpoint, there are less um, programs like that. And it's funny, someone asked me about this, the other developer actually asked me, and I said, you know, I don't think the government is really, you know, trying to help landlords buy more stuff or do more things. I just, I haven't seen those incentives. Now, they're all different types of things. You have historical tax credits, and there are these things to help low income. Uh, there, there are programs. I would say for the average person, I would stay away from anything with hooks in it in the beginning because you really need to understand the business. And I wouldn't want someone's vision to be blurred by different types of incentives because those incentives are designed to create certain behaviors that may or may not work for the individual fha financing or things like that where you get a little bit of a kiss i call it for for home ownership it's exactly what it is it's home ownership um the investment stuff could be hey we want you to work with distressed assets or we want you to work with um uh, but like real distressed assets you don't want that to be your first gig um you don't want to deal necessarily with low-income tax credit projects in the beginning because there's a bunch of paperwork and certain people you have to lease to. And I, you just don't want to do all of that, if that makes sense. You just kind of want to follow a simple model. Makes total sense, yeah. Give us an overview of all the rest of the services you're offering as a company. I know you um, have a very 
wide variety of service offerings. Um, can you guide us through? Sure. So, um, no, number one, our goal is really to make a positive difference in lives of individuals involved with real estate, uh, I'm sorry, residential real estate. And so it may be someone needs some valuation services. You know, what's my property worth? Um, you know, what's the best use for my property? You know, uh, uh, it could be, um, you know, taking a look at their profit and loss statements and seeing if they're getting the right amount of revenue in, are they spending the right amount in expenses? Uh, you know, you know, what does our tax situation look like? What is our insurance situation? Look like? So that's, that's some of the, the complicated stuff, um, you know, but we, we like working with just that retired couple that really wants to be assured they can get a monthly check every month. We, you know, we buy distressed assets. We may buy lender notes, you know, we may, um, Sometimes we do things called syndications where we will bring individuals in that have um, money and they need to invest and they may, you know, they want to get a certain return, but they don't want to actually do day to day anything. They just want a certain return. We do that. Um, gosh, I mean, we will we will consult for attorneys on certain real estate matters and sure, you know, just, so we, we just do a bunch of different things re really related to residential real estate. We're good at those things. And so, uh, and, and if we can't answer it, we can direct, um, direct an individual to, you know, someone that, that, that probably does handle it. Perfect. Do you have any tips for first time home buyers? Any tips for, for so if you're just going to buy a home, not for residential purposes, um, you know, I, my comment would be don't buy beyond your, um, you, you, you don't want to, it's not, not overpaying because over time you're going to be okay with that if it's just your personal home. But don't don't become house poor. Don't put yourself into a position that, that you're hanging out in the house every weekend because you have to hang out in the house every weekend. You know that you have the ability to go enjoy yourself, and um, uh, that that, that would be yourself. my suggestion. Yeah. Don't okay. stretch yourself. That right. would be that would really be my my opinion. And, and 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 you know get yourself in the position that you can handle the debt because if you can't, you're going to put yourself in a position that that asset becomes distressed and then you get somebody like me that eventually buys it. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Um, actually, you know, I know your time is limited and I, I really appreciate the, the conversation we have been having and I would like to already conclude a little bit. Um, if you, if you allow me, I really appreciate um, the start. You um, gave us a very nice overview about Richmond, Virginia, um, guide us through all the neighborhoods, especially for the international audience. Uh, we went into a little bit of your mission, of your starting, and also um, of the entire company idea. And I really like the anecdote regarding also a little bit like the political and societal effects which we are having and which we are going through. You gave us a very interesting idea of how you started your entire company, especially the challenges. Um, very, very interesting regarding the 2008 crisis from you. Uh, highly effective. And then going the, going towards the offense and say, okay, we're going to make it work with also you being humble and saying, no, it was actually my partner or my my employee triggering you and pushing you and say okay we're gonna make that work and then you started this entire blueprint uh with your company and the the, the process is now uh, until you only have to touch the case when it's um yeah a very severe one which is very good so basically you you allow you allowed yourself and created like the systems and processes so that your company works on its own um, you also then went and told us very nicely about the mortgage rates, about the trends. And finally, you gave us a quick overview on a, a tip, which which I think is universal. Don't stretch yourself. Uh, make sure that you still live because in the end, that's, that's what life is about. Um, is there anything 
you would like to mention before we close uh, something which you haven't been able to to articulate? No, I just I, I wish the listeners all the best, and uh, you know, probably don't allow fear and anxiety to overcome action. And that's something that I still today uh, wrestle with. And so I just, you know, I know that it's difficult sometimes to fight fear and anxiety. And I wish everyone the, the best in overcoming some of those obstacles. Perfect. Kai, thank you so much. Um, I leave all your contact details in the show notes so people can reach out to you. And um, I'm sending the best regards to uh, Richmond, Virginia. Thanks so much, Michael. Bye-bye. This video is brought to you by Holocasa. Our tool transforms independent local real estate agents to global real estate agents. Create your own profile for free and get contacted by international investors. Sign up with the link in the description.